we're going to talk about SMP and MPI parallelism, and then talk about Python in the first hour here. And I'm, and I'm jumping in on page 59. <clears throat> So client server and batch mode execution, those are very important tools to be able to deal with large data. And I've answered the question this morning, how big is big? Big is what doesn't fit really on your local resource. So when it doesn't fit, you have to go to a remote server. Yet if the data fits, nicely onto your laptop, you can use another form of parallelism called SMP, or symmetric multiprocessing parallelism. On my laptop, I have it compiled with TBB, the Intel threading building block. So I'm going to review that with some examples. In the VTK toolkit, there is a, a sub kit, if you want, called the, the VTK SMP tools. This is an effort that was started in 2013. And uh, it offers quite a bit of classes which are multi-threaded by default. And I highlighted here in red a couple of those, uh, a number of those classes I will exercise. This is one way to do SMP parallelism. And then as of VTK8, there is yet another version of VTK, if you want, called VTKM, which is opening now to multiple backends, such as CUDA, for example. But we're not going to, uh, to treat this today or tomorrow. So the first example I have is with particle physics or oh, I should say astrophysics. This is data from the University of Zurich, a cloud of particle from a smooth uh, SPH. What does it mean? Smooth particle hydrodynamic simulation. So there's basically my data set here. And what I want is to just slice through it. So a slice is a gridded representation of the data, but yet here I have particles only. So how do I go from particles only to this slice uh, representation? I use it, I use a particular set of function which you find in Paraview as SPH interpolators. So the VTK SPH interpolators use exactly the, the same SPH kernels that are used in simulation for the interpolation of data between neighboring particles. And I had done a couple of uh, years ago uh, a benchmark on using Intel TBB on one of the Pete's Day compute node to do that slice interpolation with, SP, with the SPH data. And as you can see, I could get a pretty, pretty nice, nice speed up in terms of number of threads going from one to four to eight to, to nine to 18 to 36, and then with diminishing returns all the way to 72 threads. Why, why 72 on the on the pitch dome, on the pitch daint, uh, multi-core node, we have a dual socket Intel Xeon processor with 18 cores each. So two times 18 is 36. With hyper threadings, it, may, it gives me 72 threads usable. So this was the first example using the SPH interpolation. Another example from particle data. Here I have a data set, which is actually this. This is the original data set. It's a fish or something that looks like a fish. And this is what I would like to have. 
So for this reconstruction, I'm using three different uh, filters, which are SMP accelerated. One of them is a PCA normal estimation to add normals to the, to the cloud of points. So as you perhaps know, when you have a surface representation, the normals are vectors pointing on each vertex of the surface. There are normals, there are vectors pointing in the direction perpendicular to the surface. And to compute that direction perpendicular to the surface, you need to look at the neighbor points, and then you do an average of, uh, of normals. Now, when you have a cloud of points, you don't really know what your neighbors are. So this is exactly what this PCNA, PCA normal estimation filter does. It will add a normals vector to the point. Now, the name in English, the English name normals, spelled exactly like this, N, uppercase N, that's a reserved word in Paraview. So if you have a specific data field called normals, Paraview will know how to use it to do the shading of surfaces, for example. So this is important to get this right. Then with the VTK sign distance uh, filter, I generate a volumetric scale field surrounding the cloud of points. And then finally, with the extract surface, I generate the, what is called the zero crossing surface, isosurface, and I get this approximation here of the surface uh, from the point cloud. So this would be the original data. This is the final data. And in between, it took a lot of debugging, actually several months, because the, and this is a case where visualization was not used to make pretty pictures. Visualization was extremely important in debugging the simulation. So think of it that way. Here are the normals. So here I'm looking inside, over here, inside the body of the fish. And here are the normals. This is the final image, so everything looks correct. As you can see, all my little vectors here for each point, point inside the, uh, the cavity. And by the way, for this particular picture here, I have used something called ambient light occlusion. Ambient light occlusion is the fact that if I look under the table here, there's a lot less ambient light from the, from the lights above me, so it will be darker. This is what happens here. As I look inside the cavity of the fish, there's no light, there's no much light coming all the way down here, and it greatly helps in the contrast of things, so you can really see the difference uh, nicely. This ambient light occlusion uh, will be done tomorrow. We will do that with the ray tracing techniques. Another example from using an SMP accelerated technique is this uh, example of the uh, shear layer convection. And here I wanted to, to create multiple slices through the volume to get a feeling for, uh, for, the, for the volume, for the inside of the volume. Now I used a special class in VTK called the Flying Edge Plane Cutter. This is something you will find under, the, under a special plugin in Paraview called the Accelerated Algorithm. So if you go to your Paraview interface, load plugins, and if you load 
the accelerated algorithm you will have that class. And basically what, you've, what, you've, what you're seeing here in a loop for nearly 250 slices of creating a slice, I offset that particular slice and I append, this is the append polydata filter which allows me to accumulate multiple results into a single object. I accumulate that representation into one object. Well, <clears throat> guess what? Using VTK flying edge plane cutter for 250 slices, execution type, time on my laptop is 6.3 seconds. Using the, tra the traditional slicing like you have in Paraview takes nearly three minutes. So there's a great advantage in using uh, this particular uh, class. So how does, how does uh, I'm going to show you the SMP in action. And first of all, I'm going to show you my compilation script. There's this specific line to compile Paraview, VTK SMP implementation type, and I selected TBB, the Intel threading block, build the, the Intel, yeah, the, the Intel threading building blocks, TBB, there. And that's basically all, all I have to do. The other option is to use OpenMP, and I've tested that, uh, not recently, but in previous versions of Paraview, I never got very good results with OpenMP. So TBB is my favorite uh, implement. No, you don't. No, I use GNU. I use GNU here. Uh, I'm going to load a script here, which is this one. Which exercises that uh, TBB There we go. So this is the utilization on my CPU. I've got 12 cores. As you can tell, they're, they're really working 100% uh, on this SPH interpolation here. I've, I forgot what parameters I have given for the SPH interpolators, but uh, I'm surely giving here all the work I can to the uh, to the multiple, to the multiple uh, threads. Now this is transparent to the user. So if TBB has been enabled, some algorithms will use the, the classic execution model. Some others will use uh, TBB. Here, that's uh, I probably used the wrong. Uh, interpolation uh, parameters here. This is why it's taking, uh, it's taking so long, but uh, that's, yeah, that's not the best demonst demonstration I have.
It's done by default. So. No, you don't. You do not connect to a server when you do this. Let me see. I wanted to show you this, the manage plugin uh, menu. And over here on the very top is this accelerated algorithm plugin, which I have mentioned earlier. I have this loaded by default in, uh, in Paraview. Now, MPI parallelism. It's pretty, I, I'm trying to make it simple. I say it's transparent to the user. <clears throat> and in fact, this morning, I've demonstrated to you that I could run on four, or on three, or on one processor using exactly the same script, and it would always work. This is because I, as shown this morning, the, the scheduler, if you want, in Paraview is capable of, recog of recognizing how many servers are available. And now I'm talking about PV servers. In, as a function of the number of PV servers available, it's capable of subdividing the regions of space or the volumes into independent pieces, which can be traded in parallel by the, by the multiple pipelines. And then what Paraview does to cover it up, it composes the images together. So from the graphical user interface point of view, all you see is a single image. Now, Python scripts, in general, in 98% of the cases, will be run unchanged, and I'm going to, to I'm going to demonstrate that uh, on my laptop right now. Of course, as already shown this morning, just running your job with MPI exec does not guarantee that your I/O will execute in parallel, so you need to be careful with that. So before I go, I go to the next slide. Let me run an example. There we go. We're going to start some Python, so watch carefully. I can do it in several ways. I can use pvpython, like this, from paraview, that simple import star. I can type the command sphere, which creates an object a spherical object, very good so far. I will show that object, and if you recall, it's the renderer that triggers the execution. So I type, I type render, and there I have an image. Very simple image of a sphere of resolution you can guess one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There, so basically, and by the way, that's about the only thing I can do with this. I, can, I cannot interact with it. 
But basically, there's the syntax from paraview.simple import all the paraview wrap, wrapped uh, modules, create a sphere, show it, render. That's four lines. It's difficult to beat. Huh? I'm going to put that into a Python, a, into a Python command file. From Paraview simple import, sphere, show, render. There. And I can execute this paraview script equals, and there's my sphere, okay? With the advantage that I now have a graphical user interface, so I can modify this sphere. I can change its resolution, for example, 16, there we go and I have a final sphere. So I started from, that, from those four lines of Python code. Is that simple enough? Pretty, pretty much, eh? Now we're going, we're going to augment that because we want to change the resolution of the sphere. So what's what we're going to do. Let me reload it. And by the way, you should be able to follow exactly this at the same time I speak. You should be able to do that on your own laptop. There's my sphere object. I would like to change the resolution, which is called Theta, I'm going to change that to 32, so it makes it obvious that I've made a change. Okay, there it is. I'm going to get a Python shell inside the Paraview client. So if you don't have it already here on your menu, you go to the View menu and you select Python shell over here. All right. I'm going to get a, a Python handle to that object. So I'm going to call it S equals get active source. And there's tab completion, as you can test. So No? So S is my object. So S theta resolution is, I hope it's, uh, it's pretty clear here what I've done. <coughs> See, S, I, I got a handle to the object, get active source. S theta resolution is 32. That's exactly what I had changed in the graphical user interface. So now I have two different ways of changing this. I can change it through the graphical user interface or I can change it via the Python shell. So let's try it. If I go theta resolution equals four, return, nothing happened. Why so? because you have to render, exactly. So now, I can type render in the Python shell, or I can simply move to my rendering window here and watch it. As I move the mouse, it changes the resolution. Because by moving the mouse, I trigger the render call. Okay, very good. So, let's go back to my Python script, 
over here. I need, an, I need a name for that object, so I call it S equals sphere, and I say S theta resolution equals 32. And now I reload my paraview, and sure enough, I have what I wanted. What is the what? Oh, I, I just created it here. Uh, I I just used an editor and I and I copied those four lines. I ha I had not prepared it beforehand. Okay, so if you type this into a little script on your computer into a file onto your computer and load this, this is what you'll have. And basically, we have the pipeline here. We have the source object, the sphere. Showing it is the mapper, and then rendering it is the sink. <clears throat> now, what is implicit here is that every time you type a new, the name of a new filter, it takes as input the name that was defined just above it. So here, when I type so, it's obvious that so uh, deals with the object sphere. So watch this now. I could do C equals cone, show, I could reload this Paraview script, and I now have a sphere and a cone. There's the cone, and there's the sphere. OK? I think it's, it's, it, it is worth waiting for all of you to have that on the screen. Tell me if you're having trouble with that. And if you don't know how to edit, create a file on your computer, perhaps you could do this. Let me get rid of the cone. Actually, we're going to do multiple things here. Yes? Is there a way when you have that uh, source in, uh, in Paraview to see what the properties of the object are? Yes. So to see, like, for example, like the resolution, the resolution of all the properties? Yes. So S equals sphere. here s dot list properties okay and that list properties is good for any python object inside paraview all right so here we have it now we could very well at this point say save state and we've discussed this during the lunchtime break I never use the PVSM option, I use the Python option. And here I'm going to call it foo.python, foo number two.python. I'll say OK. Pardon me? Exactly, yeah. I think you got it already. Uh, I don't know what offers the best, the best contrast is probably, probably white and black. So there's what Paraview saved. 
it's pretty long. I'm going to show you how we can reduce that to the four lines. Okay? So this we get rid of. Here's the first line we need. From paraview.simple import star. That we will need all the time. Create a view, well, okay. We can keep it, but if there's no view and you say render, Paraview creates one by default. So we don't need that either. I'll get rid of it. Get rid of the layout, et cetera, et cetera. There's my sphere. Set active source. Well, by default, I told you, when you create an object, it becomes the active source. So we don't need, the, we don't need this either. I'm surprised there's no show. Probably because I didn't click on the button to show it. But there, we're back to our four lines. And it will execute uh, just the same. There's my sphere, okay? Uh, because because uh, implicitly it doesn't need it either. <laughs> yes, yes. So let me redo this. Actually, source. Sphere. There's a sphere. Now the sphere is visible, okay? And I will switch to surface with edges. There. I will save that particular Python script. Save state. And we're going to look again at at what's in here. There's, there's the sphere object, and there's the show command. So by default, show takes the active source and the active view. This is why earlier I did not specify those two arguments. If there's only one object and only one view, it will just display my object. And what is important is this second line, the representation is surface with edges. This is what we selected. And here again, <clears throat> Here again, there's no, there's no render code. So I'm back here, and I have my sphere. And by the way, the sphere is exactly in the same position that I had before. And that is so important. If you want to make a film, if you want to make or maybe just a single image, but if you have to repeat, you want that image to be exactly the same. So this would be the thing to keep absolutely in your file. I'll show you what it is. It's right here. The camera position, X, Y, Z, the camera view up, X, Y, Z, camera parallel scale. Those are the numbers that are important. So the camera position, that should be pretty obvious, is where am I to take a picture of the scene? The second point is where am I looking at? Am I looking at here 
or over here, and that's the camera uh, <coughs> camera position. Oh, it's actually not written here because it defaults to zero zero zero. But it's called the camera focal point. Okay? And then the view up vector, what is it? It's the position from the camera point of view of this, ver this vertical here. Because I can look at you like this, or I can look at you like this. I'm still looking at the same point, but the view would be changed. So this view up vector is very important. All right? Now, why is the camera focal point missing? Because by default, it's set to 0, 0, 0. And when I saved the script, I told, him, I told him to not save the default values. But we're going to do it, uh, do something else now. Yes, I have, I have a picture of this view up vector, actually, which I will show you right away, and that will, oops, that will answer. There. There's an object. In red is the view up vector. Well, yeah. Not, not, for, not for this picture, but this is for the animation exercise of tomorrow morning, where we're going to have to set the view up vector. We're going to do the camera is going to move along like this. And every time, the blue vector is the vector pointing to the focal point. As you can tell here, I'm always pointing towards the teapot. And I'm keeping my view vector up. So basically, I'm going to do, for this exercise tomorrow, the teapot is in the middle here, and I'm going to go like this, always looking at the center. And that will be my animation. So the view of vector always, the view of vector can point anywhere. That's the message. Often it points up like this because it's, it's more human. It's a cross yes, yes. <clears throat> so there's this object, and then I'm going to create another object called uh, I, I don't know what, a, a super quadric. No, that was a bad example. A, actually, I take it again and I displace it by There, I have two objects, maybe even less. There, I have two objects like this. I'm going to save my state now. There we go. I wanted to show you that there's a camera position and a camera focal point. OK? And there's also a camera view up. So those would be, will be very important in um, setting up your visualization. 
Very good. Now, let's go back to this example here. So, I don't want the cone either. I want this very simple four lines of code, a sphere. Do you have that working on your laptop, all of you? You can't lie to me, eh? Uh, on the radio this morning, I, I, I was listening to the, the news. They were saying how Johnson in the UK, first of all, they said he gave the wrong, the wrong advice to the queen. And then the reporter said, no, actually, he lied to the queen. So uh, that was the, the thing about lying. There, there is this. A sphere of size 32 in the theta direction. Good. Can we run this in parallel? Yes, we can. Here's how we do it. Parallel view. Settings. How many processors do you want? I'm going to use three. Because three is not a... It's not a friendly number. Pardon me? This is under settings. Yeah, it will depend on the version you have, if you can enable auto MPI or not. Can you? No, you cannot. So you have it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for the tip. So for Windows as well, I think it's compiled in with the free MPI version for Windows. I think I had tested that. Oh, yes. Uh, all right, so three. I'm choosing three. I need to quit and restart. And I'm going to restart exactly the same line. Paraview script is full. What do you expect? Before I run it, tell me what do you expect to see? Yeah, that's a good answer. There's a better answer. It's going to, for sure, subdivide in the theta direction because it's a bigger number. So Paraview looks at which dimension is bigger and it starts dividing by that direction. So let's run it. I have an MPI exec here with three processors. There is my sphere, which looks exactly like a, like a good old sphere and, and that's, a good, that's a good sign. And when I color it by the processor number, that's what I get. So all the lessons we've learned this morning about Paraview being magically capable of subdividing your data, it applies also, for example, to the sphere here. Okay? If the source is capable of creating a sub-piece, Paraview will divide it. So you can try with three, and you can try with seven, and you can try with any numbers. Yeah, to color, you go over here to that option here. See over here, you have the VTK process ID. I, I, I remember that you should use the microphone to ask questions, but perhaps I will also repeat the question. Um, why, if you, if you check now the memory usage, does it 
then it looks like in your in your server you have six bands. The zero zero one one two two and only the zero zero one. Oh one yes. Two, one, yeah, let's uh, let me bring let me bring it up on my screen. The view memory. The question is about this. <clears throat> Do you have the same? I mean, did you run on three? Okay, so I have this. Yeah, indeed. In fact, I have zero zero one. That looks pretty wrong to me. Those numbers look wrong. Anyway, we have three, we have three servers. They all seem to take almost exactly the same amount of memory, so the load is balanced. But the numbers right here, I don't know what. I think they're confused with those numbers. Another question. No, there isn't. Yes, yes. The number of servers will depend on the launch command, not on the script itself. So on Pete's date, tomorrow, I hope by tomorrow we have all those running also on Pete's date. It will depend on the S1 command and the number of tasks we give to the job here. It depends on the, on the MPI exec. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's the example here. So in fact, over here, when I run, I run Paraview in parallel by setting up the number of, of tasks, of MPI tasks. But I could do it manually, and this is how I, how I would do it. I would get two terminals. OK. One of them is this one. I would run MPI exec, for example, 5. And I would, I would run PV server like this. And what happens now, I have launched a server which is waiting for a connection from a client. And it's accepting connection right there on that default number 11,111. All right. If I go to my second window over here, and if I run Paraview minus minus server, I forgot the syntax now, because I never do this. Minus server equals localhost. There we go, I'm connected. I'll show you what happened on the other window. Remember, the, the other window was waiting for the client. Then the client connected and said, OK, I'm connected. And the seven or five, five tasks found the graphics card on my laptop. They said, OK, this is the GeForce card. And now I'm running on five. So I have an empty window. Can I run my little script from before? Of course I can. I go to my Python shell. I say execute foo.py. And there's my sphere. How many colors this time? Five. Five colors. So there, I've basically finished the lecture about MPI parallelism, because it just works out of the box. Most of the time, 
independently of the number of processors. Now, if you have a sphere of resolution 32 around the globe, and if you ask for 512 processors, uh, there, there will be 480 processors doing nothing because the minimum piece of data that can be treated is one cell. That's pretty obvious, right? So I propose for you to do this exercise as well on your laptop if you have MPI, if you have the parallel version enabled as well on your laptop. And I will repeat those uh, particular steps with you. So run an MPI exec or under Windows, I don't know how you would do that, to launch the server in parallel. But in win in here on my laptop, I would I would do MPI exec the full path of the server, and that server waits on port number eleven thousand one hundred, and in a second window, you tell Paraview to connect to the server, which in this case is my own computer, so it's local host. Just to make a, another example, I've reloaded the second example I had, which included also the super quadric. And let's see how the coloring was done. This is a pretty good demonstration, actually, that the sphere was divided in three, but the superquadric was not. So this is a case where actually one source can and the other cannot be divided in, um, in multiple pieces. Yes, you can. When would you like, so the question is, can you actually enforce your own subdivision? Eh? When would you want to do that? I'll give, you, I'll give you an example where you would want to specify, to specify a particular subdivision. As I said earlier, um, Paraview will take the dimensions the, in the x, y, and z direction, and it will do a binary subdivision, first of all in the x direction, then in the y direction, then in the Z, and then in a round robin fashion like this. But suppose you're reading some binary data. The example from lunchtime, where you have a huge volume of data where X is the fastest reading direction, yes. It would be a lot more, a lot, a lot faster to read data by chunks 
in one single direction, in that case, you, would, you could enforce the subdivision given by Paraview to be only along a particular direction. And this, you would have to program. This is very advanced. This is a class called the VTK Extent Translator. And here you could tell it anything you want. There are four options, basically. Divide along x, divide along y, divide along z, and divide using a KD3, and that is the default option. VTK Extend Translator, yes. Okay, I'm nearly finished with the uh, presentation and it's perfect because it's two o'clock. So MPI, we've demonstrated that. It's rather transparent. The Python scripts run unchanged. You of course have to be aware, you have to keep uh, looking at your IO and at your data sources. Make sure the data sources is capable of producing sub pieces. And then the best of both worlds, perhaps, is a world where you mix parallelism, SMP on the node, and MPI across nodes. So there is an example for this, which is the digital rock physics plugin introduced in version 5.5. And I will show you an example of this. <coughs> from my build directory. So when you compile Paraview, you compile with CMake. That's an obligatory uh, step, I should say. And then CMake comes also with a command called ctest. And with ctest, you can give it a keyword and it will search for an example, a regression test based on that particular uh, keyword. So I'm going to do that to demonstrate if I do see test, by the way, there's a thousand tests available on my laptop here. Those are the regression tests. So this is, you'd understand why we're still at release candidate number four and it's kind of difficult to get that release done. It's because all those tests have to pass and because they have to pass on Windows, Mac OS, Android, and all the different devices you have around it, it's taking a bit of time. But let's take that example, digital, digital work. And there, this is basically what it does. It's an automated process which will run all the different tests and compare those tests against a particular image. Now, in that case, there were four tests Based on this keyword, there were four tests which were run. All of them passed, so that was perfect. I'm going to show you uh, explicitly one of them, which I will call, which is this one. I will do C test minus V minus R. V is for verbose, and there it is. 
And now I will copy that line all the way here, except the exit part, so that I can run it again. And there it stays on the screen. Okay? And now I can explain what, what we're seeing. So we basically have a volume of data over here, with a, which I can show as a surface. And the color here represents multiple materials in this data. So they can be a rock, they can be foam, they can be air, they can be anything you want. Uh, so the Digital Rocks plugin was developed exactly for this to isolate. Let me see. Let me do an explode factor of zero. See, it basically removed. I will put this guy up. Removed the air, the empty space, to keep only the space that is occupied by different materials. And each of those materials are classified. I can get a list of those materials. I can get a volume of the volume occupied by each of those materials, etc., etc. So let, let's, per, let's, for example, go to the spreadsheet view over here. Select the Okay, good. We have isolated those materials. Now you want to do an analysis on them. You want to extract the biggest material. How do you do this? Well, you know that, it, you know that it's the red one, because red is always big. But how do you extract it? This is where visualiz there's more than just visualization in Paraview. You can also do analysis. And that's very important. So we want the volume of this red thing, and we want to extract it as an, as an object by itself. Here's the, there are two ways to do it. But I can basically go to my spreadsheet view. Select the object, go to my cell data, and there's a column over here called volume. Perhaps it's a bit, it's too small for you to, to see. There's volume. There we go. And right there, there's a little arrow. I can classify this in increasing or decreasing order. So if I click over here, the smallest minimum, yeah, smallest minimum value is one. It's exactly one cell. The biggest is 19863, which means that this particular zone in red has a volume of 19,863 units. OK. That's very good information, because now I can extract based on that unit. I will quit the spreadsheet. I will go to Find Data. If I find it, there we go. I will go to Cells. Volume is 19.83. Thank you. 1963, run selection query. Uh, no. What is the number? OK. No, no, we want volume. What was the number? We'll do it again. Spreadsheet. Cell data, 
19863. Okay, my mistake. Volume 19863. One selection query. Now, multiple things happen here, and that's, that's really powerful. I run a query. So this is my query. Volume is equal to 1983. As soon as, as I said, run selection query, all those numbers here in the spreadsheet were selected. I don't know if you saw that. I'll have to redo it again. And at the same time, over here, let me do extract selection and close. At the same time, in the 3D view window, this material got selected. So I now have a way to do cross select or linked selection if you want. I can select data directly from over here for example, I want, if I wanted to look at the cell number 0 to 10, I could select those directly in the spreadsheet view and see their image here in 3D and vice versa. <coughs> now, I have this written in plain English. Query volume equals 19863, and I'm going to apply this now. And reset. I need to get out of this mode here because it gets confused. There's my volume right here. OK, and the original was here. And I put it in outline mode. There it is. I have isolated exactly the material I wanted. But what is the criteria of sorting this material to that part of the corner? Well, that's part of the digital rock physics plugin. It, it's basically based. It's it's based on connectivity. Because it basically it traverses the volume, looks at the material ID on each of the cell. And it does a, a widespread traversal of the volume until it finds cells which, have, which are contiguous and which have the same material ID. It connects them together. And then when it finds the next cell with a different ID, it stops iteration it goes to the different number. So there, in any case, we have here demonstrated a pretty nice example. And that, why did I talk about this? Is because the digital rock physics plugin works both with SMP parallelism on the node and with MPI parallelism across multiple compute nodes. So you can apply that to some very big data. Yes, in that case, it's only SMP because I'm running only on my laptop. And this basically ends my presentation for the parallelism. And at the same time, the Python interface, because we've done all of this together, this was meant to be an hour block time. In Ken's tutorial pages 75 to 94, you will find exactly that demonstration, the sphere, show, render, and all those different tools we have exercised. So now I will stop talking and I will invite you to run those examples on your own computer and then and so on pitch date, if we can. B 
before I, yes. Uh, actually, a couple more minutes. Before I stop this, do you have any questions concerning that example I showed about the query, the find data, the spreadsheet view? I can rerun some explanation if you want. Yes, of course we can, yeah. If, yeah, if you, go, if you go to your find data menu here, say you have a list, uh, perhaps it's too small to, to read. There. Is between a certain range, one of less, mean, max, etc. And then you can do boolean of those different uh, queries. Okay, I will stop here for this particular example.